Welcome to our first uh, Sunday night meeting this year, um, Baltimore Baseball Babble, and obviously right before opening day. Uh, we have David, we'll talk in just a second. I know he's spoken to us in the past, I believe. I'd have to look back. So I'm a little under the weather. I just got back from my mom's house in um, up in Scranton. Um, so I'm dealing with stuff here at home, and uh, my wife is sick. So once we get going, I have to step out and do a few things once uh, David's talk starts. Um, I have read his current book. Uh, I was lucky enough to get an advanced uh, pre-publication copy. And uh, then they sent me a, um, when it was released, January, February. Um, wonder, wonderful book, wonderful story. Obviously, uh, those of us who are Orioles fans love that uh, 66 uh, World Series championship photo that made the cover. Um, Wick. The only administrative stuff, if anybody is submitting a um, article for the upcoming newsletter, has to be in by the 31st or the 1st. Um, David, you are co-host, so if anybody hops on and you notice, you can admit them. Um, we are recording, so this will go up on Saber's uh, webpage, and, and Jacob and does all the magic that he does. Um, and... Uh, probably talk a little bit later. I expect Dave to do talk for about 20 or so minutes and you guys will do your questions. I'll be back. So I'm just going to step out for a few and then kind of go for a blank screen. Um, so uh, if you can, guys can go on mute and uh, I'll let uh, Mr. Carell from the Northern Jersey chapter take it from here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank you for the generous blurb that you gave for the book. I really appreciate it. I just sent Peter a discount code. If you order the book from Roman and Littlefield directly, you can get a 30% discount if you use this code. Amazon is not presently offering a discount. So I'll leave it to your own counsel on how you want to proceed if you buy a copy of the book. So I'd like to talk about three things involving Do You Believe in Magic? Baseball and America in the groundbreaking year of 1966. I want to talk about the culture of 1966, then baseball, and then research, how I went about strategizing and organizing and actually doing the research for this book. The culture of 66 was such that it was a year of change. It was a year of revolution in some sense. When you look at popular culture, you look at Batman, certainly. No one had ever seen a show like Batman. It was a comic book on screen. But Batman didn't survive without the help of these wonderful character actors like Burgess Meredith and Art Carney and Cesar Romero and Eartha Kitt and Roddy McDowell, and David Wayne, and Frank Gorshin, and John Astin, and the list goes on and on. It only lasted uh, two and a half seasons. It was off the air in 68, but in 66, it really spearheaded a superhero genre. As you know, in Hollywood, once there's a successful, unique product, everyone tries to copy it. So that Saturday, some of you may remember that Saturday morning lineup for CBS in the fall of 66, they called it Super Saturday. Every single show had a superhero component. Uh, William Dozier, who produced Batman, also produced The Green Hornet, which was more a straightforward detective show based on the radio show in the 30s. Trivia, The Green Hornet is the grandnephew of The Lone Ranger although that was not mentioned in the TV show. And there was a crossover where the Green Hornet and, and uh, Cato uh, visited Gotham City. So that was one thing that was really prevalent. Uh, the space race certainly in the 60s was huge uh, and Hollywood took advantage of that. We had Star Trek and Lost in Space imagining the future. Uh, you certainly had I Dream of Genie with a, an astronaut component because the main character and his sidekick, uh, Major Nelson and Major Healy, first, first they were captains, uh, they were astronauts at Co in Cocoa Beach. So there was a, a, a definite link to NASA through that show, even though it was a, a sitcom and it was full of slapstick and, and things of that nature, you still had the NASA logo everywhere in that show. Uh, what else happened in 66? The spy genre was big. 
because of Dr. No and James Bond in 1962. So by 66, you have Mission Impossible premiering. You have I Spy had been on the air for a year. A, a Bill Cosby was the first uh, Black actor to win the Emmy. He won it all three years that I Spy was on the air uh, for best actor, for best uh, lead actor in a show. He was the first to win that. So you had a, 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 a real um, culture shift. And of course, with, with uh, the espionage genre, later on, you had the Avengers. Dean Martin appeared in two Matt Helm films. He, he play, uh, appeared in four, I believe, in total, but two in 66. And Alan and Rossi, the great comedy team, even had a, a spy spoof. I was not able to get my hands on a copy, but it was one of these uh, real flamboyant, slapstick-filled comedy uh, spoofs of the spy genre. <clears throat> uh, Valley of the Dolls broke a lot of ground in literature. Uh, Jacqueline Suzanne covered taboo topics, never before covered to that extent in a novel. It became a bestseller. And the thing about Jacqueline Suzanne, which was really interesting, it wasn't, to me, it wasn't about what she wrote about as much as how she marketed. Uh, she wrote about sex and she wrote about drugs. The word dolls refers to pills. It does not refer to women. Uh, she went to the warehouses. She went to the truck drivers who were delivering her book to the bookstores. She got to know them. I mean, she went down to the front lines. She wanted to make sure that you know, okay, I wrote the book. Now it, now we have to execute the marketing and the sales. So she wanted to know who was on the front lines of that operation. And the book became a bestseller. James Mishner was another best-selling author that year. He uh, wrote The Source, which was an epic history of Judaism and Israel from ancient times all the way through present day, which was the mid-60s. And it's centered around this archaeological project and every time they find an artifact, that there's a chapter relating to that artifact's original existence. Uh, it, it, you can learn a tremendous amount about reading Mishner, whether it's Israel and the source, Chesapeake Bay and Chesapeake, Hawaii, Alaska, Texas. Those were the names of his novels. Uh, he, they're all wonderful, epic docudramas, and I, I recommend them to, to anybody. Baseball. So here's here's what's going on in baseball. Uh, and I only touched on, on the culture part for a little bit because I, I have a limited amount of time. But baseball in 66 was more than the Orioles. There was a stadium that uh, still exists. It was built in 1966, or I should say it was it was it debuted in 1966. Angel Stadium in Anaheim. And it would be real easy to find information about Gene Autry. And I'll get to the Orioles in a minute. I know we're in the Baltimore chapter. Uh, I did not want to go with the obvious. And I found a picture of, a, uh, of a, the mayor of Anaheim with Gene Autry at an Angels game in the 70s, some kind of pregame ceremony. His name is Jack Dutton. And I said, well, oh, that's interesting. He was, let me, let me find more about this guy. So I did some digging. He was a politician. He was a, a city politician in the 60s. And he was really the driving force behind that stadium. So his daughter gave me an interview, generous woman with her time, very, very key to my research. And I wanted to know more about this guy. He, ha he was a lifelong resident of Anaheim. He was a self-made millionaire. He really embraced the city. He wanted it to do well. And what better way to elevate your city's presence if you're in the shadow of LA than to have a stadium. And when people would have the, the contrary point of, well, shouldn't we put all that money into schools or teachers or parks, et cetera, his, his vision was really one of marketing. Because if you have 81 games in Anaheim, every visiting team's beat writers are going to be writing Anaheim in the byline. Every visiting team's radio and TV broadcasters are going to be mentioning Anaheim in the broadcasts. That plus the, the convention center really elevated Anaheim 
by the end of the 60s. And I, I wanted to stress that point now, and I wanted to stress it in the book as well. So 66, let's talk about the Orioles. Uh, the Orioles, as you know, came close in 64. They uh, were managed by Hank Bauer, and they clinched on September 22nd. I'll get to the relevance of that in a moment. They faced the Dodgers in the World Series. The Dodgers had a three-way pennant race right to the end of the season. The Pirates and the Giants and the Dodgers. Really formidable, really tough. Well, when you clinch a pennant a couple of weeks before the World Series in those days, you can take a breather. You can rest your starters. You don't have the pressure of winning every single day. Every error doesn't mean life and death. The Dodgers did not have that luxury. Nonetheless, they were professionals and they were great at what they did. They had to face a younger Orioles team. And what happens? Well, Dave McNally gets into a little bit of trouble in game one. So Hank Bauer calls on Mo Drabowski. And Mo Drabowski at that point, as you may recall, was a relief pitcher. He was not a starter anymore. They had shifted him that season. And he was a journeyman. He had been on a couple of teams before. And he was a fun-loving guy, a prankster, from what I'm told, a good clubhouse guy. So Hank Bauer calls in Mo, and Mo, as the baseball card says the next year, Mo mows them down, sets a relief pitching record for strikeouts in a World Series game, becomes an instant celebrity in Baltimore, and is certainly beloved. His family gave me background information. Here's where it gets a, a little magical to uh, borrow a, a to borrow the word that I use in the title, which is, as you know, is a, a love and spoonful song. The, I say magical, if you believe in karma, if you believe in the supernatural, if you believe in angels, if you believe in anything like that, you might be reinforced by what I'm about to tell you. If you don't, then maybe you'll get nudged a little bit towards that line. Mo had a family member who died on that date seven years before that exact date of the world series game in 1966 he had a close relative die seven years prior now i won't go into it too much here it's in the book and there's a poem about it at the very end so if you do read the book and you get to chapter 12 and you finish turn the page because there's a poem that follows it, it didn't belong in the narrative but i wanted it as an appendix when I heard that story, when the family told me that story, I said, I, I, this, this has to go in the book. This story has to go in the book because who says you can't be romantic about baseball as Brad Pitt says in Moneyball. This is one of those great stories, I assure you. The Orioles sweep in four. If you ask Dodgers fans in 1966, if you ask Dodgers fans who were around in 66, they will say, well, my guys were tired. My guy, my guys left everything in the NL pennant race. They, they were just tired. And I suspect if you ask a couple of Dodgers, they may say the same thing. But nonetheless, you still had to perform. I mean, you're talking about Tommy Davis and Maury Wills. You have to go against Koufax and Drysdale. Uh, Koufax, of course, retires after the season to the dismay of Dodgers fans and to the dismay of owners across the National League because let's face it uh, Koufax and Drysdale were draws and at the beginning of the season which is most of chapter two they were a, a a joint holdout which struck fear not only into the hearts of Dodgers and, and Dodgers management but also other owners you have a, a marquee player visiting that's money in your pocket that's fans in the seats and that wasn't going to happen without the dynamic duo of Drysdale and Koufax. Koufax, of course, led the majors in wins the last two seasons of his career. I believe he also led in strikeouts the last two seasons of his career. But in November, he makes an announcement that he just can't do it anymore. You've seen pictures. His arm is in ice. He's in pain. He has to take shots. It's, it's a real tough existence. But for those 
four seasons, 63, well, actually five seasons, 62 to 66, he was just absolutely fearsome and dominant. So I'd like to talk thirdly about the research. Baltimore played a big part in my research, and that's why I want to mention it tonight. Not everything is on the internet. Karen has heard me talk about this in the Northern New Jersey meetings. Not everything is available on ProQuest or newspapers.com. You can get quite a bit, but you can't get everything. So of course, if I'm doing a, a book that concerns the Dodgers and the Orioles in the World Series, I want the biggest newspapers in that town. Now, I can get the LA Times and the Baltimore Sun on ProQuest and newspapers.com. I can get some LA newspapers on, on newspapers.com, like the Citizen News and the Press Telegram. The Herald Examiner was not available. And the News American in Baltimore was not available. So for the LA paper, I went through interlibrary loan at the New York Public Library and an archive in Chicago generously allowed us to borrow the microfilm for the entire year of the Herald Examiner. So that's why you'll see in the end notes, I have the LA Herald Examiner quite a bit because I used it as backup to the Times for research about Koufax and Drysdale. And the reason is maybe I can get a quote in the Herald Examiner that's not in the Times. Maybe when Koufax and Drysdale settled the, their differences with Dodgers management and they signed for the season, maybe the dollar figure reported in one paper is not reported in another. Maybe they have two differing figures. So I wanted to let the reader know as much as possible. Same thing with the News American. I went to the pennant race, I went to the World Series games, and I uploaded to a flash drive everything I could. Now, with Baltimore, I just went down there because it's only three hours away, and I stayed there a couple of nights. Baltimore Public Library, terrific staff, extraordinarily helpful and generous. And without their help, I wouldn't have been able to, to do it. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do it without flash drives, wouldn't have been able to do it without the microfilm machines that have the flash drive port. So if you're not in, in a big city or you can't get to a city and you're in the suburbs, I recommend going to your local library and finding out if your microfilm machine has that flash drive port. Do you have a state-of-the-art microfilm machine? Because if you have one of those clunky items from the 70s and 80s where you have to put quarters in to photocopy a page, you're going to be coming out with hundreds of pages. It'll be impossible to organize. A lot of grunt work goes into a project like this. You have to separate it however you can. I usually separate it by date, and then I use a, an, initial, uh, an initial system to designate the, the newspaper. So it'll be 1966 dash 10 slash one dash BNA for the News American. And if it's more than one article from that newspaper date, then it's BNA number one, BNA number two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, just finally, I, I really enjoyed writing this because I, I didn't know too much about the year other than some of the things I mentioned. But even then, I didn't know about William Dozier, and I interviewed his daughter. He was the producer who put Batman on the air. I didn't know too much about Mo Drabowski, and I interviewed his family. I didn't know about the three-way pennant race, so I got a chance to, to research that uh, and, and realize how formidable the Giants were in the 60s. You know, they were perennial. It seemed like they were perennial second-place finishes but they were such strong teams with Mays and McCovey and Cepeda. Uh, I, I really marveled at that. Uh, other things that are in the book, Caesar's Palace debuted that year. Uh, first Black woman on the federal judiciary, Constance Baker Motley, was that year. Uh, she's important in two baseball cases, which I write about. One was Melissa Lutke's case. She was a, uh, a uh, female reporter who was denied access to the Yankee Stadium clubhouse. And Constance Baker Motley said, look, either all reporters get in or no reporters get in. You, you can't 
exclude someone from doing their job. And the next case she did that involved baseball, or the next case that I could find rather, was the Brooklyn Dodger case where the LA Dodgers and MLB sued a bar in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Dodger. And she said, look, you, you, you abandoned the borough and you don't use the name to any significant degree. So you really don't have a cause of action here. And, and she found in favor of the bar for using the Brooklyn Dodger name. So I, I'm delighted to take any questions that you might have. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Again, the name of the book is Do You Believe in Magic? Baseball and America in the Groundbreaking Year of 1966. It's published by Roman and Littlefield. Uh, Peter will circulate, I'm sure, the email that I just gave him, which has the discount code, which allows you to get a 30% uh, discount rate. Uh, if, you, if you go to Amazon right now, you'll pay full price. I don't know what it's going to be tomorrow. I know Amazon might get you the book quicker, but if time is not of the essence, it's, it's up to you on, on how to procure a copy. Anybody have questions for uh, David? Um, I put the code in the chat and I will also blast it out to um, everybody who's on our uh, chapter roster probably tomorrow morning. Francis isn't here tonight, it's one of our usuals. You guys have to unmute yourselves if you want to ask a question. It seems quite improbable that, that the Dodgers pitching staff you know, didn't didn't quite deliver because you had historically, I mean, that the starting four pitches, you had Koufax, Drysdale, Sutton, and, and Claude Osteen. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the next thing to a Hall of Fame lineup right there. Yeah. And also Joe Moeller, who who spot yeah. started, you know, coming out, you know, normally uh long reliever, they were they were saying that he had almost as good stuff as Koufax. Well, Moeller reason. is is interviewed in the book and I, I have to give credit to the Dodgers. There is something to that theory. It, it, they were pushed to the end of the season. And it, that's a that's tough when you're not only battling one team, but two. Uh, it, it, it just came out that uh, they, they emerged victorious. Uh, look, they had, they had gone to the World Series in 63 and swept New York. They had gone in 65 and went seven games against the Twins. Uh, it, it was just one of those uh, fluke things where they, you know, the, the Orioles were just able to uh, capitalize on on things. Willie Davis made three errors in an inning, I think. Yeah. Um, yes. That that was just not good for Dodgers fans at all. Uh, the, there were there were a lot of things that came together, but uh, you know, pound for pound, I, I think you'll. It's hard to find a better team than the Dodgers of the early to mid '60s. Also, the Dodgers pitching wasn't really that bad in the series. So the two of the one to nothing games. Right. And, all the, and the unearned runs that Willie Davis errors allowed. So the Dodgers yeah. pitched pretty good really in that series. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments, rebuttal, concerns? <laughs> Everybody's quiet this week. Usually we're a chatterbox house, but it's everyone's, also the end of the month and the weather hasn't been too cooperative. Everyone's uh, everyone's muted, I think. And they can unmute well, if they want. Yeah, yeah. You can unmute when you have a question. Um, well, uh, Oops, I'm sorry. David, did I ask you, are you going to Chicago? No. Okay. You did not ask me and the answer is I am not going. I I'm leaning towards it, but it's not a hundred percent in stone. Um, you just, you never know. Um, all right. Anybody else? I, can I just say one more thing about the research aspect of this, since we are a research organization. Certainly. Uh, one, one lesson that I've learned along the way of doing these books, this is my fifth book. The, the more you do the grunt work at the beginning, the better off you're going to be. The more you get your ducks in a row, get organized, label your files. Don't think that, okay, I 
got everything I need, and now I'm going to write the chapter, and then I'll go on to the next chapter. There will always be something that pops up later on that you may or may not want to incorporate, but get as much of that organization out of the way because you do not want to be searching for something 1130 at night when you're working late. You want to be able to go to that folder, which has that date and that newspaper, and make sure you have the quote. Or if you need to get information, you should be able to find it in 10 seconds on your computer. Uh, it, it It's really boring, but the way I look at it, if you're going to be home on a rainy day and the Orioles are playing the Angels and you're watching that game anyway and they're out in in Anaheim, you might as well have it on in the background and, and do some organization. You don't have to write every day, but it's good to do something every day in furtherance of your writing goal. And organization is one of them. The earlier, the better. Did, did you uh, did you speak to any uh, former players or anything that had any uh, comment on Frank Robinson about, because he came over from the Reds after 65 and the Reds figured he was an old 30 or whatever it was. And Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, no, I didn't get a chance to talk to them about that specifically. That is referenced in the book, though, that Reds management thought he was over the hill and geez, the, the guy wins the triple crown and hits a ball out of the stadium. I, I, he was fearsome a fearsome hitter. But Jeff Torborg was interviewed for the book. Joe Moeller was interviewed for the book. Uh, I, you know, Jeff was very, um, very helpful in talking about Koufax and Drysdale. And look, these guys wanted their teammates to get the money. They, they, they knew what they did. You know, they knew that the Dodgers success largely came from their arms. <laughs> So they were advocating for them. It's also funny enough, he didn't have anything to do with it, but it's also the year that Marvin Miller became the union chief. And what was interesting and revelatory to me is it was not unanimous. There were players that did not want him. They thought he would interfere with their relationship with the owners. They thought that he would be bad news. It would ruin rapport. It turns out that he he turned a lot of people's heads largely by listening. When he went around to the teams in spring training, he just wanted to listen to them and, and hear their gripes. What were the day-to-day -day problems? What about a travel day? If you're going on a road trip for nine games, when's the next home game after you come back? Is it the next day? Do you get a day break? So there were things like that that came into play, but it was not unanimous by any stretch of the imagination. Karen, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to, if you could go over a little bit about the role of the librarian. Librarians are your allies. Yes. Librarians are your friends. The more obscure question, the better. Thank <laughs> them. Use words like please generous, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I always send a thank you card on my stationery. They are, and be specific. If you go to a library, any library say, uh, I'm, I'm researching Reggie Jackson coming to the Yankees. Can you help me? Well, that's not really specific, but if you have a date when he signed the contract and you say, oh, what newspapers do you have on microfilm from this date? then they'll be able to help you. Same thing with Baltimore. I emailed the librarian, I believe, before I went down there. And when I got to Baltimore, I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to look at the News American. I can get the sun. And I asked if there were any other sources I should be looking at. Are there any other items that you suggest? That would come in handy if you're doing research on an old ballpark where they might be, be able to direct you to maps and, and things of that nature. Where, where was Memorial Stadium in, relation to, in relationship to the city? I, I didn't get that far because I had other topics. If this book were solely about the 66 Orioles, I probably would have had a chapter on Memorial Stadium. And I probably would have spent a day pouring over maps and the construction of Memorial 
and how it was built and when it was built and who did the financing. But as, as you all know, whether it's an article for a Saber website, like the Games Project, uh, you know, if it's if it's an article for the, the Bio Project or it's a 250 page book, you have to make cuts. And I, I had to unfortunately move on and, and I only had a limited amount of words and space with which to deal with these topics. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned that some players did not want Marvin Miller to represent them. Right. Um, who else was in play that that the some of the players were interested in as a rep representative? God, I, I don't have that in front of me, but I'm just okay. talking in a general sense. Okay. They believed that this union guy was going to upset the owners yeah. to the point where they'd be out of a job where a, an owner might say, well, you know, you're griping about making, you know, $8,000 or whatever the guy was making at that point. Let's say, let's say it was 20,000 making 20,000 a year. We can get someone to do it for 15. We don't, sure. we don't need your complaining. And Marvin Miller really turned a lot of heads with Koufax and Drysdale, the problem there was Buzzy Bavesi, the GM, was concerned that this would set a precedent. What happens when three outfielders band together? What happens when a double play combination bands together? Uh, that was the real danger. But you know, fortunately, it got resolved. And it got resolved by none other than Chuck Connors, the actor who... <laughs> was in the Dodgers organization and the Cubs organization and obviously had a pipeline to uh, to the GM's office. And he is in the book. He's in the picture at the press conference, not in the front row. He's at the table with the two pitchers, the GM, Koufax, Drysdale, Pavese, and Connors. Hmm. <laughs> So with the holdout with Drysdale and Koufax, they didn't quite get what they had asked for from O'Malley. They settled uh, at a lesser they, amount. Well, they, they compromised, and the and the yeah. the figures differed from paper to paper. Sure, but they they really they got more than they were getting. That's for certain. Sure, sure. But they and the holdout lasted a month. Yeah, they were ready to walk. They were ready to walk. As, as far as I could see, that, that was the general tenor of the reporting. And whether it was a bluff or not, it, it, it worked. And you got, you got Koufax for one more season, and Drysdale, I think, retired in 69. So he was there for good, uh, a good three, I think, three, four seasons. I don't know. I, I don't have it in front of me about about when sure. he retired in 69. And of course, that amazing season in 68. Sure. Yeah, that, that was my next question. You, 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 you answered it, though, was how close were they actually really to walking away, both well, of them? They were talking about a film career. They were talking about yeah. acting. And, yeah. and Drysdale, I don't know how, I, I don't have any um, information about his his salary or or anything like that, but I think he performed in Las Vegas. He did, but, yes. yeah. So he he had and and he was it was obvious that he was going the television route, which he did later on. He became a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandy Koufax did not go that route. Yeah. Interesting, and thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. And Trisdale did a couple episodes of The Rifleman too. He yes, did, he did. And, and of course he showed greg brady his secret slider <laughs> and i and wasn't sandy koufax in the mr ed episode oh i don't remember that I remember that <laughs> yeah I, I think he was oh. wow i remember mr ed hitting a home run yep i know, I know yeah. leo derocher was on the monsters that was a great monsters, episode. The monsters and the Beverly Hillbillies. Oh, and the, oh, thing yeah, about, okay. the thing about the monsters episode that <laughs> aired in '65, oh, and man. Vietnam had not really escalated as it did in the late '60s. And after that whole montage of Herman 
hitting the ball and knocking over the scoreboard and hitting the ball and goes underground. Leo DeRocher says to the reporter, I don't know whether to sign him to the Dodgers or send him to Vietnam, ah, which oh is really, really interesting that oh. Vietnam made oh, that, uh, made a primetime show that early in the conflict. Mm. And, if, and if you're wondering, Vietnam is mentioned towards the end of the book, but as I say, it was not at the level that it was in 67 or 68. And they also were saying they couldn't sign God Herman because it was going to cost him 50,000 bucks after every game. Something, like, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> 50,000 or 75,000. Yeah. Something along those lines. Anybody else? Francis, you came late. Any, any questions? No, uh, no, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I remember that that year too well. <laughs> I mean, I I was, yeah, I was in my twenties, so uh, yeah, a lot of the things that you've spoken of and written about, I I re recollect. It's one of those overlooked years. I was looking around after I did a book about '62, and you know, '68's been done to death. '69's been done in so many different forms. And I looked at 66, I said, geez, I only found one book, Black and Blue, and that was only about the World Series. And I like looking at things in a cultural context. If you've read any of my saber pieces, you, you, you can pick that up pretty easily. I like knowing what were people wearing and what was, the, what was on television, what were the songs, uh, what, what was going on in baseball beyond the scores, you know, who was traded what stadiums were going up, what ownership was changing hands. And I, I just think that's terribly important to put things in context. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, I do apologize for being late. I was kind of, oh, now that the days are, now the days are a little longer. I'm, I'm outside a little more. I hear you. That's a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Don't forget, guys, our next call will be um, the day before opening day, so April 5th at 7 p.m. Um, from the Peabody Heights Brewery. So um, I, I plan on going, assuming the weather is okay. And then obviously the Orioles home opener is uh, on the 6th. Are you, are, are you going to the college game on Wednesday? You know, BC I, against Navy. I have tickets for it, but I haven't yeah. decided if I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Yeah, I have an extra one if you know anybody else that wants a ticket. All right. Yeah, metal metal bats in the ballpark don't really do it. For oh, me. that's right. D didn't they do something to make them not sound so medley? I I don't know. I think they did over the years. Oh wow. So. David, if I might interject, yeah. is, uh, is there a meeting of the Elysian Fields chapter on Zoom tomorrow night, or did I have that on my calendar? No, it's, to, it's tomorrow night. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 7 to 8.30. Yeah, okay. I'll try to make it on time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never trust a North Carolina guy. That's right. <laughs> Um, they claim the time zones are different down here, so they aren't. My father-in-law lives near Myrtle Beach, so he's off in his own time zone, too. I know. <laughs> um, questions, comments? Uh, I'll see some of you guys. Uh, obviously, Jeff will see opening day, yeah. hopefully. Um, Yankees weekend. Opening day is a bit like sold out, sold out. Um, no, so, on, yeah. on the radio today during the game, they say they had sporadic tickets available. And for people very who limited, keep returning them, you know, or last minute season ticket holders yeah. and, and, oh, and yeah. stuff like that are swapping them out, but they're really sporadic. Yeah. It might be like one here in the bleachers and then one, you know, yeah. in upper left field reserve, you know, like sure. that stuff. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Ortman, did you get your tickets? Not yet. I'm waiting till game day. I really. <laughs> Somehow floods date on game day. Okay, well, day. if you've mastered the craft, I won't. I won't say anything then. Chapter two thousand sixteen in my book. Got it. <laughs> <laughs>
Peter, if there if there are no other questions or comments, um, I'm going to get going. But I'm happy to stay for anyone else who anybody else for David. Has a, yeah. has no, I'd like to ask uh, or con concern. How do you compare the tenor of the country? You know, the the basic attitude or whatever with with today, back from '66 compared to today. Well, generally speaking, I don't because it's I, I wasn't alive then, but. Uh, overall, from what I read and from people I talked with, one thing that unified the country was the space race. There were five Gemini missions yeah. that year, and we don't have anything like that now to unify the country. We're just so fragmented and, and fractured. Uh, but when, when the Gemini missions uh, concluded and the capsules landed in, in the ocean, you know, splashdowns, uh, there was a, you know, they were... It was there was a pride. There was a great pride in the country. You know, they Kennedy had been assassinated three years before. The program was still going forward to land a man on the moon, and to have these uh, these missions go up and uh, and and go successfully was just a matter of terrific morale for a country that was still suffering from the assassination, uh, the increasing uncertainty of Vietnam. There was just a lot of hubbub. There was a lot of chaos uh, 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 that's an undercurrent. And I mentioned this in the book. I, I create this scene in middle class America where, uh, yes, the, the, the businessmen are smoking cigars and playing cards and the housewives are talking about sales. But after a few martinis, they're getting a little sober and saying, you know, whose kid is next to be drafted for Vietnam? Because that was happening, too. So just totally different. David, just to add a comment about yeah. what you said earlier about uh, Marvin Miller, it was so true. And people lose track of the fact that it took years for Marvin to build trust with the players. This whole idea of strikes and lockouts. Yeah. Players strongly opposed that in the 60s. None of the Marvin Miller supported Kurt Flood in 1970. And the Players Association paid his legal expenses. But players, by and large, did not. They were afraid of the owners. And it wasn't until 72 when Reggie Jackson, of all people, stood up and told the players, let's do this. Re Marvin Miller, Miller was, the farthest, by, yeah. was the farthest thing from Marvin Miller's mind that players would actually go out on strike in 72. And they did. Mit Miller's autobiography is, is astounding, and it gives you a lot of insight uh, regarding his journey and how it wasn't easy, but he never wavered. Yeah. It was all about getting a fair deal. It wasn't about sticking it to the owners. Mm -hmm. It was get, about getting a fair deal. Right. But he had to teach the players that. It, yes. It, yes. They didn't know what a fair deal was. Right. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank and, you. And, and if you read the book, I'd be delighted to know what you think about it. It's excellent, guys. Go, yeah, pick it up if you can. If you do read it, I also encourage you to write a review on Amazon. Those are incredibly important for authors. So I, I encourage you and I ask you to consider doing that. All right. All right, Take Dave, care. have a good bye night. Bye. You guys, anything else before we say goodbye? Yeah. Yeah. No All right, questions. take care. Bye-bye. Yes. All right. Well, if nobody else has anything to discuss, I have a couple things to take care of at home. Like I said, I haven't been feeling the greatest. So, um, uh, that was my next question: Is how are you feeling? Uh, I did a little, little bit of a some, like a viral tummy trouble this weekend. So, um, yeah. but I did get up to see my mom and was able to do a, a little bit of some chores for her. So, not as awesome. much as I would have liked, but uh, um, okay. But uh, yeah, I'm doing okay. And my last, uh, my last oncology visit, my numbers were very good. So, oh, that's awesome. good. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah. Good. I'll be actually next. Good for actually the day after the home opener. I'll be uh, it'll be seven years, six years since I had my stem cell transplant. So, oh, wow. <laughs> Every day is a good one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Well, hopefully we'll see you again on the. Uh, on April 5th. And yeah. uh, if you need anything, just reach out, email, text, call, whatever. You guys know where I am. So much appreciated and uh, enjoy the uh, opening week of baseball. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.